honored that we've got Maud Barlow here today to speak to us. Maud got an honorary doctorate to add to a long list of honorary doctorates um, from the science faculty from the university at the weekend. Um, and the reason she got that at the Laudatio was to do with her inspiring work on water as a human right. Um, and Maud's been kind of instrumental in making people think about water as being something that's not just there, but it's a human right and that we have to think about and argue about. Um, and I wanted to say like two things about Maud, and I want to say something that wasn't in, in all the bios. So I asked her, it took me quite a long time to persuade her to tell me what I wanted to know. Um, so, because I think it's always interesting where people come from, yeah? And in Switzerland at the moment, we can read a lot about, for instance, degrees in the social sciences and how they have no worth and people that study philosophy or English or geography kind of is also sometimes a bit in that bag. It'd be much better if we all did STEM subjects, yeah? But Maud studied actually English and history a long time ago, I guess. Um, and that English and history um, seems to have been a pretty good springboard for doing things that kind of change the world in a way. So I think that's a really important message for me and for all of us when we think about things. I think thinking at what we do at one point and saying how that predicts where we'll end up and how much we influence things is not a very good way of thinking about the world. I think a much better way of thinking about it is that Lots of different things have value in different ways that are not always easy to predict. And then the other thing that I think is really important about Maud is that she was very active in the women's movement. Um, and that's something also that if you read Tagi Sandsider, you can regularly read interviews and things about, yeah, we really need gender equality in Switzerland, we really need gender equality offices and so on. What's the point of all that stuff? And it's only to do with pronouns and documents and anyway, that doesn't matter. Um, I think probably most of us don't agree with that, but I think also it's really interesting to see how Maud's made the, the journey from women's rights to water, something that's about women, but it's also about everybody. And I think most of the stuff that has to come, comes from that direction that's to do about, with thinking about minorities ends up being thinking about everybody. And I think that's also a really important thing about Maud's journey that for me um, makes it valuable. And then the third thing that I think is really cool is how she doesn't talk about the world in a sort of near doomed way, which sometimes in geography um, we're kind of a bit familiar with. All of the people that are working in climate science, it's all about, you know, okay, how bad is it going to be? Maud also talks a lot about hope and ideas to do with hope and the fact that even if we change things a little bit and make things a little bit better, that's a big step. And for me, I think that's also a really cool thing. So I'm really pleased that you're here. Maud's now going to talk. There's no slides. Uh, we're recording this for people that are interested in your uh, little small people in the picture as well. So if you don't want to be recorded, tell us before the end. And then at the end of the talk, Ilya, my colleague, will chair the questions. So thanks a lot, Maud, for coming. We're really looking forward to hearing you. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for a gorgeous introduction to us. And I just want to say a big shout out to the people who've made Andrew and me uh, so welcome here in Zurich and in Switzerland this week. Um, you and Ilya, of course, will be here after. Um, Roland Brunner, Carl Fulberger, and Lisa Krebs, who runs the Blue Communities Project in uh, Switzerland. We'll hear more about it in a few minutes. We came all the way from Bern today to, to be here. Just, a uh, big shout out to uh, wonderful people here. We love coming back to Switzerland. There's something so special. When we go to Bern or we have secret airs. <laughs> we love the airs. Um, so I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. And as, as Ross said, I was honored with a uh, rare doctorate here on Saturday morning. It was a beautiful ceremony. And I was particularly pleased that I didn't have to say anything. <laughs> we just got to sit there and enjoy it. And the orchestra from your university is fabulous. It was really a, a very professional and beautifully done. Um, so I'm, I'm just honored. So I'm here today to get you to think blue. I think we're all thinking green a lot. And some of us think blue as well. And I'm here to really put us to, 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 to move over and make room for blue. Um, really to stop seeing water as an endless resource. The more sophisticated our uh, countries, our communities, our societies get, the more we tend to see all of nature as just something for us. 
Uh, I remember being in one university and having a little debate with the principal of the university who said, well, you're anti-technology. And I said, well, I'm not really. I got here on a plane and I think I've written all my books on the computer and I have an iPhone and everything. What do you mean I'm anti-technology? Well, I just keep believing in the wild because I believe that it's still, they kept talking about friends of this. I have friends who say we don't need wilderness, we don't need um, nature anymore. We can we can grow all our food, do everything in cities and so on. And he said, What do you think of that? And I said, Actually, I think you need new friends. <laughs> really? So we, we've got to stop seeing water as an endless resource for our profit <clears throat> and our pleasure and our convenience, and most importantly, as a way to continue to grow our industrial society because it is absolutely hurting the, the world. We have to stop thinking that way, particularly those of us like you guys and like me who comes from Canada, who come from water rich parts of the world. It's very easy to think that in all the water that's been here will always be here. And they have what I call the myth of abundance. <clears throat> you know, you can do anything with water, you can take as much as you want, you can dump whatever you want in it because it'll always be here. And you know that that's not true. Um, and I want us to learn to care for what Pedro Arroyo, he is the UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights to Water and Sanitation. He calls water the blue soul of water. Uh, it's just the kind of way of seeing water that I'm, I'm urging us all to, to learn. About a month ago, Central New York World Water Day, about 10,000 people of us gathered in New York City for the very first UN conference on water in almost 50 years. The last one they had was 1977. Now, when you know that they have the COP every year, the, 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 you know, the climate summit every year, they have biodiversity summits and so on, to think that there hasn't been one on water in almost 50 years tells you how we collectively are still seeing water. We actually sort of tend to see it as a, a subset of, uh, of climate, and it's really important that we stop doing that. And they sound the alarm. The UN has been sounding the alarm for a long time, as have many others. But they basically we came into that conference with a very clear set of concerns, really two crises, one ecological and ecological impact and one um, uh, uh, human. The ecological crisis and the facts are absolutely stunning. The planet is running out of accessible fresh water, which is something we all learned back when we were little. It was impossible to do because there's a finite set amount of water that was here when the dinosaurs were here. It's the same water, not just the same amount. Um, but the UN says that the lack of water is the gut, they call it the scourge of the earth. And they report to us now that within 10 years, <clears throat> they actually said 2030, I'm, I'm pushing it to, to 10 years, they said that a demand will outstrip supply by 40%. And just let your mind and your heart try to understand what those kinds of numbers mean. Now, as I said earlier, it's not just climate change. You tend to see reporters and many others who say, well, if climate change is created by greenhouse gas emissions, we all know that, and that is impacting water, and that is true. With the melting glaciers, <clears throat> and you know that, and Canada know that, but our glaciers as well. Um, and it warms lakes and rivers and hurts a lot of life, you know, all of these things. But we don't tend to understand that when you remove vegetation, or you remove water from a local hydrologic cycle, the rain goes away, the local hydrologic cycle doesn't operate in the way that it should. And we are humans are diverting, polluting, mismanaging, over-extracting, and damming our rivers to death and, and, and extracting our groundwater um, in an absolutely outrageous um, uh, way, thinking that we'll never have, uh, you know, ever, ever run out. And I have a, <clears throat> excuse me, a memory of, um, people in Mexico that found a, um, a, a new aquifer. It's not going to handle all their problems in Mexico City, but it was a new aquifer about six or seven years ago. And the engineer who took up the very first cup of that water when they were able to access the drain, and he said, this is why you protect groundwater, because we are going to need it all. Um, so it, it uh, is my deep contention, and I know there are a lot of people in this room who would know this better than I, that the, not just the, this climate uh, impact water, but our abuse of water is impacting climate. And, and consequently, or subsequently, when we, um, when we uh, restore watersheds, we move somewhat towards uh, dealing with and, and mediating uh, climate. 
Now, it's not just in the global south. Again, a major study just two or three days ago said Europe is moving into from Astrides south yet, and that the mighty rivers of Europe are, are in deep decline. Do you know this? I mean, you live here, you know this. Um, but it's really been something we thought had lived, existed in other parts of the world and not where we live. In our country, the prairies, beautiful British Columbia, absolutely having horrible summers and, and, um, and terrible uh, fire seasons because uh, we're experiencing a terrible drought, not just because of climate, because we've overextracted and abused water. And you know, Switzerland is uh, increasing, uh, facing increased pressure on the groundwater. And of course, you know the issues of your melting glacier should have experts right here in the room. If this current loss is sustained, half of the 1,500 alpine glaciers may disappear in the next 30 years. And I foresee, and I've studied a lot and traveled a lot around the issue of water conflicts, um, including some like a um, the late 1990s, when the World Bank forced a, a part of Bolivia, a landlocked uh, country in South America, to privatize their water, um, the private company came in and tripled the price of water. And the local people who are mostly indigenous couldn't afford it, so they were capturing water in cisterns and so on. And the government then, or the company then said, with the government's backing, we own the water that comes from the rain. And if we catch you, capture them, we'll find you and put you in jail. I'm not picking that up. The people went to the streets, took to the streets. They were made as well. The other people were killed. It was really one of the first real water wars. Um, and um, they won. And the World Bank was forced to back off. The company was closed and water came under public management. And I remember talking to the Man who led the fight, he was a shoemaker, never been outside of Cochabamba in his life, an indigenous uh, leader. And I said, Where did you get the courage to stand up to the World Bank and the Army? And he said, Always remember this. He said, Because I'd rather die of a bullet than thirst. Um, so it's, it's, it's really, uh, we need to understand that um, there is huge potential for conflict. And I know one of the, and I'd love to hear from the people in your geography department here, but I understand one of the solutions that people are looking at uh, for the glacier amounts here is to collect that in, in lakes, but there's going to be um, discussion with downstream uh, users uh, who are going to say, we, we need that water too. And it's not impossible to think that in 10 or 20 years, maybe even 10 or 15 years, Switzerland's going to be in a dialogue, a debate, um, an argument with uh, others around this. So that's the first crisis, it's ecological. And the second is human. In my view, if you look at straight numbers, the lack of water is one of the greatest human rights uh, violations of our time. While some have all the water that they need and want and more, one quarter of the population of the world is forced to drink uh, contaminated water every day, and one and a half of the population of the world does not have adequate access to sanitation. These are just stunning statistics. You know, really just stunning statistics in 2023. More children die of waterborne disease than all forms of violence put together, including war. And almost two-thirds of the world's population currently lives in an area that at least one of the year is in a water scarce or water severe uh, situation. And so, you know, the the impact on humans, especially humans who are living in an area where they not only don't have water, but they don't have money to buy the water that might be available. Um, is a huge crisis. So now when we were in at the UN conference in, in, um, in New York City, everyone agreed on this. This was something pretty good because I have, uh, believe me, when people say, of course dogs are human rights, you have no idea the fight that we had to make water and human right to get it recognized at the United Nations. It was a huge fight. My own country at the time had an awful right-wing government and they fought this to the nail. They were the leading opponent of of the human right to water, but the World Bank was opposed in many countries, first, first world countries, and all the big water corporations. I mean, it was a, a fight because we said if you call it a, a human right, then it's an issue of justice, right? Whereas if you call it um, a need, it's an issue of charity. And that's a very different way of, of looking at this thing. 
So when we were in New York City, nobody argued anymore that it's not a human right. In fact, people were talking about uh, the wash cycle being a commons, which is very much language of our, our side, if you want, has been using for a long time, um, but it's definitely being picked up by everyone. However, there isn't an agreement on how you get to the human right to water or how you get to water security. There are really so what I call a mighty contest going on, and I don't know who's going to win it. On one side, there are those who say the answer to the twin crises, ecological and human, is to put water on the open market for sale, like oil and gas, and let the private sector control water and its price. Um, and on the other is a uh, uh, global water justice movement, there's a very strong one here in this country, that is clear that water is a fundamental human right, and importantly, it's a public trust, and it must be protected in law for all time by um, democratic governance and by local transparent governance. There's a place for the private sector in our water crisis, laying the pipes for the infrastructure, data collection, alternative energy sources, all sorts of things. But in terms of dealing with who has access to water, how who is getting access to the actual water, and how you get delivered to water, or water delivered to you, must be a, a democratic process. So there are many forms of water commodification. The first is the privatization of water services. It started with <clears throat> Pinochet, the, election, the, the um, dictator in uh, Chile, who, privatized not only all the water services, but basically said, <clears throat> excuse me, all our water is up for sale forever. Um, for, um, big mining companies like companies from Canada come down there and they bid again for the water sources like lakes and rivers and springs against local farmers and indigenous people, and they, they, they're able to buy it. Um, and Margaret Thatcher, <clears throat> like, I brought water on, okay. <clears throat> And uh, Margaret Thatcher started it in Great Britain in, 1990, in 1987. She privatized water, and the, I still think the sessions are fully privatized in, in Great Britain, except for Ireland. Uh, but it's really worth taking a look at what happens there. The companies dump their, their effort into the Thames and all the other rivers. The CEOs make a huge amount of money. They don't pay taxes. It's like just a case study of what goes wrong. Um, so privatization was then picked up by the World Bank that would go to the countries of the global south and say, if you want funding for uh, water services, you have to bring in a private company. And then it's bottled water, which may seem benign, but most of the bottled water in the world now is in plastic. I mean, Europeans still put some of it in, in, in uh, glass, but mostly uh, around the world now it's in plastic. We sell the human, humans buy a million tons of bottles of water every minute. Um, and that's in a half a trillion a year. Um, if we were to put them end to end, one million plastic bottles, I'm sorry, are, are sold every year. If we were to put them end to end, they would uh, reach just one year's use of plastic. It's mainly use plastic bottles. Um, they would reach halfway to the sun. Um, and uh, most, of course, are not recycled. And again, getting ready for the UN conference, they put out a new study saying that in spite of all the work that we're doing around plastics, and everybody knows the plastics crisis is upon us, that the bottled water is uh, set to double uh, within the next 10 years. So, we, you know, we have, we can see this, and of course, we do own that water when we get a contract as a private company, and also, also the big mining companies or the big ag companies that they come into the global south, get a contract with the local government, they own the land, they own the water for 100 years or whatever, they can dump their tailings, they basically have privatized the water. Then there are water markets and water trading. This is what you find in Australia, you find in Chile, you find in the United States where you separate the water from the land and you sell the water separately. Um, and in, in Australia, when they set it up, they thought, well, that's a good idea because we don't have a lot of water and we're running out of that terrible drought. So maybe if we privatize the water, the farmers will conserve because they can sell their extra water and that would be good for everybody. Well, of course, the big farmers bought out the small farmers, the big investors moved in, the big global investors moved in, the price of water jacked up so high um, that when the government tried to buy back, a new government tried to buy back uh, its water, they, they couldn't afford it. Um, but the newest is in uh, the United States, they've allowed <coughs> water futures trading. 
And this is called the financialization of water. And this is instead of buying the actual water, you're buying assets of water. In other words, you're buying, you're betting on the future. You're betting that the price of water is going to go up. And so big investors or big ag companies and others buy up uh, or now have the opportunity to buy up uh, massive amounts of water assets and just sit on it. Until the water is um, more valuable, which is pretty likely to go, I think, from um, what we're, we're dealing with. Um, so, which way we're going to go, commodities <clears throat> or commerce, is absolutely crucial to dealing with both the protection of watershed. If it's, a pro if it's driven by profit, who's going to protect it? Whose rules are going to, to, to uh, um, you know, whose rules are going to, to protect the water in the end? Uh, if, <clears throat> <clears throat> <laughs> if the dead hand of the market is allowed to determine the fate of water, the profit motive, not the protection of water and not the protection of the human right to water, will prevail. And it will be, it will be nearly impossible um, to prevent the coming crisis. So we know there's a coming crisis. We know it's everywhere. We know it's going to be here in Switzerland in time. The question is, what do we do from here to when it well, it's already here in many places? What do we do getting ready for it? And I deeply believe that we have to set certain values, certain parameters around the decisions we make, and we need to have that debate rather than just say, oh, we'll all somehow work out. Now, there are very many good summons. The United Nations in July, on July 28, 2010, recognized the human rights to water and sanitation. As I said earlier, it was a huge fight. Um, I was in the balcony at the General Assembly when they made that decision, and I, we thought we were going to lose. I had staff with me and my, my organization, and they were in tears because we were sure we were going to lose. And they would have been such a fight against it. And nobody's ready for this. Wait 10 years and all these, you know, oh, yeah, wait, how many more kids are going to die? Um, waiting for you to be ready for this. And it was really interesting when they vote, they vote on a big uh, electronic um, board. So you know right away, 122 countries voted in favor. None of the countries, including the ones that were so opposed, voted against. They abstained, which was good. This was the beginning. And since then, there are almost 50 countries that have either amended their constitution or they've changed and introduced a new law uh, recognizing the human right to water. A number of key legal precedents have used the resolution. Um, a number of years ago in Botswana, uh, the government of uh, this country tried to get all the, the local indigenous people or hunter gatherers living very much like their ancestors. They wanted them out of the Kalahari Desert. And they said, uh, you know, we put them up in cement block apartments, and the people kept coming back. So they they uh, destroyed their water bowls, their water bowls. And they said that anybody bringing water to them would be fined or put in jail. It was a terrible thing. People didn't die. So they took it to court, and they were given the right to move back into the Calahari, but they weren't given the right to water. And when our resolution was adopted in the United Nations, they went to the Supreme Court of Botswana, and the Supreme Court of Botswana said, yes, you have the human right to water, so says the UN, and those four walls must be open, and the government has to pay restitution. So we've had some very exciting um, moments coming out of this, but we are in a race against time because we can have all the human rights you want if you don't have the clean water there. Um, it's a moot point. And then we have something that we call blue communities. Now, blue communities is something we started in Canada <clears throat> back in 2009. We had a government that was doing what the World Bank was doing to poor countries, uh, basically saying to our municipalities, if you want federal funding for water services or for new infrastructure, you have to bring in a private uh, company. So we decided, um, we're, well, we're always against everything. Let's be for something. So we were for a vision called Blue Communities. And Blue Communities basically was a way of saying, this is the vision that we have. And that municipalities would pledge to recognize water and sanitation as human rights, to pledge to keep water as a public trust and not to allow privatization. And where safe public tap water is available, 
to make sure that we start phasing with plastic bottled water. Cities like Paris that became a blue community actually set up a whole program to educate people uh, around uh, safety of tap water, which is very much a part of, of your culture here too. Uh, and then the fourth that came along after was promoting public public partnerships with cities and municipalities in the global south. So the cities of the north that are helping cities of the south, the global south, to introduce um, good water services, that they would say, no, we don't want these private water companies. We want to help you to become uh, independent and and, um, uh, and and maintain control over your public water. So it started in Canada, it was spread right across the country. And then I was in Bern, Switzerland, right here, uh, about 10 years ago, and I met the then mayor of Bern, and he, I told him about food communities. He said, I love it. Could we do it here? So we brought me back a year later, and the city of Bern became the first municipality outside of Canada to become a blue community, and uh, the University of Bern and the Reformed Church of Bern all became blue communities. And since then, there are 40 blue communities in Switzerland that have taken the pledge to protect water, both protect water itself or protect water as a human right. Um, and it's moved to universities, it's moved to faith based groups. The World Council of Churches, which represents close to 600 million Christians around the world, became a blue community in 2016, and they work with their communities everywhere to promote the concept of their faith-based uh, notion and belief that the Creator has given them a gift of life, and that they owe something back um, in terms of taking care of, of, of Mother Earth, and it's really a very, very powerful thing. There are now 25 million people living in blue community cities um, around the world. I would love Zurich to become one of them. Um, and it was a pleasure last year to be here at this time when the, this university became a blue community. And it's joining universities here in, in Switzerland, but a number around the world. And we just got a whole bunch uh, happening in Canada. So I, I'd love to see this notion of, of blue communities uh, spreading in universities and spreading in schools. We've also also started a project called Blue Schools in our country again uh, to get to kids as very, very small and, and get them um, thinking blue. So we're taking back water, privatized water services, um, something like 340 municipalities, some of them very big like Berlin and Paris, tried privatization, realized that it was a mistake, the price went up through the roof. The water quality wasn't protected, the source wasn't protected, the services were protected. Uh, in Berlin, they had a referendum that took 600,000 votes to get a government vote um, against uh, the privatization, and they brought their water back into public service, and then they decided we never ever want to do that again, so we became, it became a good community. And one of the things they asked themselves in Berlin, and I love this, is they said, we've got clean, accessible, inexpensive, Tap water and sanitation. So, um, what's where is the human right now being fulfilled here in Berlin? Well, the migrants, the homeless people living in parks and so on. And so, they've done a, a they've set up a relationship with a young group of young people who are building um, waterless toilets, waterless washrooms, um, where they where people, I mean, that's not the answer to homelessness. I'm not suggesting that for a moment, but it is one part of the solution. Um, when you take a pledge like this, you ask, where is this issue here? And again, we think of it as being an issue far away, but in Los Angeles, which became the first American city to become a blue community, they did uh, an analysis and they said there are a million people in the greater Los Angeles area who don't have access to clean water and sanitation. So this notion that it's in the global south only is really important that um, we get rid of. And we're fighting water markets and water future trade. We have a, a bill before Congress in the United States. I chair an American organization, although I'm Canadian, and we're introducing, they're introducing a uh, legislation to prevent water futures trading because I think that's a really dangerous new facet of this uh, struggle. It will be very, very hard to control once you have big equity firms owning future water. You know, who are you going after? Um, we've long fought nesting. Um, situated here, of course, but in, in our country and in the United States. Now, Nestle divested itself, by the way, of all its North American operations. So now it's a big equity company. We kind of think, bring back Nestle, you can fight you with 
harder when it's uh, you know thousands or millions of investors. So so much has been done and so much more to do, but we have to stay steady. And I guess that's one of my my major messages to you. And Ron talked about my notion of hope. The last book I wrote uh, was on the issue of hope. Uh, Andrew and I have four grandkids, teenage grandkids, and I worry that. They're hearing the stories, even people like me giving you the stats that I've given you today, and, and maybe feeling there's nothing I can do, right? And I worry that that sense of hopelessness maybe makes people feel that the situation is hopeless, and it isn't. And it's really important to know that. It's really important that we have a mindset that says, yes, the world will be here in 10 years. I mean, I, I hear people saying, oh, there won't be any, you know, no, planet's only about 10 years left. And I think, how would that feel to be 14 and hear that, right? If it, it'll be here, will it be better or will it be worse? Well, that depends a lot on what we all choose to do now, right? And that's the notion of hope that I really want us to adopt. I'm not talking about this kind of false, everything's fine and hope, which I think has a lot of common with pessimism that we don't have to do anything about it. I borrowed a term from an American spiritual advisor who uses the term widespread, which I think is gorgeous. And she works with men on death row, so you can imagine she has something interesting to say about hope. And so wise hope requires us to face reality and not pretend everything is well. Face the issues and learn what we need to learn. Um, wise hope allows us to experience grief and doesn't, doesn't invite us to, 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 to despair. Despair is a dead end. Despair leads to burn out and, and giving up. And grief is a process to go through that gets you to the place you need to be. When Greta Thunberg first learned about the climate crisis, she was 11 years old, and she went to her room and she stayed there for two years. She lost weight, she was just a little thing anyway. She didn't eat, she was devastated. And she said the day she decided to go out of her room and go down in front of the apartment building and just be there and sit there. She had no idea she was going to launch a youth movement, right? She thought that the despair went away. As soon as she took action, she said, this is the day that everything changed for her. And she says, hope is action and, and action is hope. Psychoanalyst and poet Clarissa Estes said, she feels despair, but she says, and I love this, she says, I don't set a place for it at my table. She fights with their wise hope. And this is a, my definition of hope that I came to after, after a lot of thinking writing, writing this book. Um, the wise hope is a commitment to protect all that is good for our future generations and the planet, knowing you can't control the outcome. And that's really hard for people like me. I'm a type A, I'm an activist. I, I don't, I can do so much research and then I gotta get out and you know, fight. <laughs> Uh, the tear gas, I think, on every continent um, except Antarctica. So um, I can tell you that tear gas in Hong Kong had something really special in it. We all felt we were dying. <laughs> um, but there's things to get tear gas for, right? Um, but so wise hope tells us that you can't control every, you know, you, you don't know when you're going to win. Um, a wonderful uh, philosopher, American philosopher, Rebecca Sullivan, says progress isn't an army marching forward. It's a, it's a crab settling sideways. You don't know when something is a win. You, you're, you've worked and worked and worked and worked and you get back, and then suddenly change comes upon us like a change in weather. And the women's movement, that's very, very much what happens. When you change the notion of, 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 of women and you think, of course, it's just always like that. Um, and so, so with this definition of wise hope says, I know you're overwhelmed. Put your hand out and touch the universe in the place that you can touch it, that you can make a difference. And you have to have faith that others are doing the same thing. And that's really hard. And that's one of the reasons the faith based communities have taken on this challenge, this and the climate kind of challenge, so deeply because. Something in their faith gives them um, the long-term view that you have to you have to trust in the goodness uh, and the action of, of others. Every crisis shakes up the existing social order and opens up a way for true change. I think going through this three years of COVID 
Um, has profoundly changed the world. I don't think we'll understand it for a long time, but one of the things that really has changed is this notion of economic globalization. Free trade, let the, let the corporations make all the decisions, take all the power away from governments, um, you know, uh, deregulate, privatize social services, privatize healthcare, that whole movement that took root during the 1990s and the early 2000s uh, uh, this century, that's gone. I really feel that that's gone. Um, and, and what will replace it? We don't want that right wing populism. We want something that's responsible, some kind of a mix of public private, um, but that we need to maintain control over the essential rights that humans have education and healthcare, water services and housing, and so on. These are very, very fundamental rights. And because the market couldn't give vaccines to the global south, and because the market didn't look after the sanitation needs of people in the global south through the through the uh, COVID uh, crisis. I mean, there are millions of healthcare facilities in the global south that don't even have running water. When that became clear, um, a lot of a lot of institutions, even the World Bank, even the International Monetary Fund, even the World Trade Organization, are all talking about governments coming back. The responsibility of governments and that was what the united nations say governments the responsibility of the human rights government um, is uh, remarkably lives, lives with um, governments so why is hope asks us to take a long view and to make a lifetime commitment to change this is really important why hope tells us that we must build movements for lasting change and that doing so is more important than individual wins and losses now, there are so many exciting signs of hope. I'm not going to talk too much longer because I'd rather talk with you, but uh, we're entering what I like to think of as the age of nature. When we humans stop thinking that we dominate, that we're at the top of the pyramid and that we get to make decisions about everything uh, else, all other species and water and nature and all, and we are beginning to listen truly to the teachings of indigenous uh, peoples in our country is very important. We're going through a reconciliation um, process with First Nations in our country because we colonize them and we do terrible things to them, not me, but ancestors. Um, and it's very important that we bring together, they call it the two, the two eyes, the two rivers of science and indigenous teachings and bring them together. And there's so much to learn from indigenous teachings and that we are essentially, we are nature, we are water, we are, when we hurt water or nature, we hurt ourselves. And that is called us to change our relationship to Mother Earth and live in service to protecting um, uh, and, and restoring um, nature, wetlands and forests and, and water and soils. Recently, there's been a tsunami of treaties, international gatherings, pledges, projects dedicated, understanding and protecting the planet's biodiversity. I've been watching this for a long time and a long, a long time. It was just one view of it. Get those greenhouse gas emissions down. And now there's an understanding that even if we got rid of every greenhouse gas emission in the world tomorrow, we would have a water crisis. And so we need to think about biodiversity, protecting and restoring biodiversity, which is one of the key answers, uh, antidotes um, to the climate crisis. Um, many, many countries, including yours, have and mine, they have pledged to protect 30% of their biodiversity of their land and water by 2030, um, planting of millions of trees and so on. This is just something that uh, is the funding for this is, is, is finally coming around. And only months ago, and you probably didn't read this anywhere because it had no mainstream media that I could see, but the United Nations General Assembly recognized the human right to life of the environment, which was led by a Canadian named David Boyd, who's also the UN Special Rapporteur on Water and Human Rights. And he's written a wonderful book, uh, wonderful books on, on the importance of changing constitutions in our countries um, to protect our, our, our right to a healthy environment. And we're seeing a growing rights of nature movement that to protect lakes and rivers as living entities with their own rights. And I find this really exciting. Many countries are changing laws to protect the rights of nature, in, in particular the rights of a river to flow and thrive, 
and it's almost always led by Indigenous peoples. The first of them was in New Zealand, uh, but now we're seeing it around the world. And in the last year in northern Quebec, the province of Quebec, uh, in my country, the local Innu people, it's called Nesquik, so Innu people, have granted legal personhood to a fabulous river called the Magpie, 300 kilometers and runs down into the St. Lawrence. It's one of the last untamed rivers in the world. They are ensuring, I love this, this is what they ensure the its rights to flow, to protect its natural biodiversity, and to fill, fulfill its essential functions, to be safe from pollution, and to regenerate. And this is my favorite. They even gave the right of the river to sue governments and corporations <clears throat> that violate those other rights. And of course, the Indian people are the keepers, the stewards of the river, and we do it uh, in, on, in, in its name. This is really new stuff. We don't know how it's going to play out if it goes to the Supreme Court. We know what this really means, but it's a growing concept. And we just did an announcement last week in my country that all of the First Nations along the St. Lawrence River, the mighty St. Lawrence, which runs between Canada and the United States, have all called for the St. Lawrence to also be protected as, an, as, a, as a, a legal person, um, which is really, really exciting. Um, so imagine laws that protect Mother Earth and the healing that could come from such a revolution. So I'm going to just end the formal part of this so we can, we can talk together <clears throat> with just some uh, few uh, hopeful uh, quotes that I love, that I just identify. The first is from a Native American writer. Her name is Robin Wall Kimmerner. She wrote a beautiful book called Braiding Sweetgrass. And she said this, and this is, an, this is indigenous teachings. This is what when we need a heart of what, um, what indigenous teachings means. She said, what, what, what would it be like, I wonder, to live with a heightened sensitivity to the lives given for ours, to consider the tree in the Kleenex, the algae in the toothpaste, the oaks in the floor, the grapes in the wine, to follow back the thread of life in everything and pay it respect. Once you start, it's hard to stop, and you begin to see yourself awash in gifts. I think it's just gorgeous that you have to look around and say, well, where did this all come from? You know, who gave what for? Who, you know, who made it somewhere? And did we take them into account? And all these free trade agreements that we're negotiating, do we care about the, uh, the, the actual natural environment its impact or the people who made those folks or whatever, that computer for us. If we start to think back, if we see it holistically, it changes. I also want to share another great poet's words. Her name is Mary Oliver. She's an American. And she finds great strength in the natural world. She says that's where she goes when she needs to replenish. That's that's where she goes. And she says she doesn't know exactly what her prayer is. But she says she knows how to pay attention and fall down into the grass. She has a poem where she talks for a long time about looking at a grasshopper. They have a little talk, you know, and, and what she learns from the grasshopper. And she walks in wonder through the fields. And she asks us to heed the cry of the earth and to make that our mission. And she says, she says, tell me, and she says to young people, so this is to young people in this room, what is it you plan to do? with your one wild and precious life. So gorgeous. And, and no one said it better than the late great scientist and environmentalist Carl Sagan. We're just beginning to listen again to the words that he, 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 he predicted all of this. He predicted the climate crisis. He predicted the water crisis. He predicted the conflicts we were going to go through. He predicted the political polarization. People are going back now 30 years and saying, how did he know all? How, did, how was he so smart? <clears throat> and he said this, anything else you are interested in is not going to happen if you cannot breathe the air and drink the water. Don't sit this one out. Do something. You are by accident of faith alive at an absolutely critical moment in our planet's history. So quite, so gorgeous. And so it's been my dream, uh, my life's goal, to turn the world blue. Uh, one person, one school, one university, one municipality, one country at a time. 
because I think if we do this together, we can change the arc of the future um, in the direction it needs to go. And I'll end the formal part of this with the last quote, and this is from the Talmud, and the most beautiful words, I think. Do not be gulleted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now, love mercy now, walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for these inspiring words and also comforting, I yes. think. Um, questions, comments, discussion points. Who wants to go first? Um, maybe I'll start with a comment. Um, so I was an undergraduate student at the University of Waterloo in the early mid 90s and was given a copy of your book I think by my dad for Christmas one year um, and obviously inspired me greatly and um, now work in water. I'm a professor at the other university down the road um, and actually have another visiting professor from Canada here with me today. Um, so your your words have paid off in spades um, in some small way to us. And I guess my, my question and something that's always worried me, even as a small child, what what's going to happen to the Great Lakes when the water crisis gets bad? And are we going to go to war with the US? Yeah. So a great thank you for your lovely words. And <clears throat> think that I helped inspire your career. It was very, very lovely and touching. Thank you so much. So the Great Lakes of North America, you see a, uh, a map of, of our North America, they're mighty huge. Um, providing water for 40 million people to absolutely incredible. Uh, I got into the water issue around the whole question in Canada and the US. I came out of the woods when the as boss said, <clears throat> and I was back in the 1980s, I was reading, uh, Ronald Reagan was president of the United States, and we had a Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher type prime minister, and they decided to uh, create the first free trade agreement, modern free trade agreement, um, with all the rest of the bill. Then it was North American free trade agreement, and then the World Trade Organization was set up and so on. And I was reading this agreement one day. I was concerned about it for around social programs. It came out of the rooms with the, I was water was something that came out of the tap. Never thought about it. Um, and then I came upon the, uh, on the fact that water was included as a trade of the good. Water in all its forms, including ice and snow. <clears throat> and I thought, what in God's name can that possibly mean that water is a trade of the good? Because what you have to understand about free trade agreements. They sound good, it's free, it's trade, what could go wrong? Basically, uh, the essence of, of these trade agreements is to take away regulatory power from governments and give them to the private sector or give it to the market, let the market make decisions. Um, and so they will list in a free trade agreement, they will list the things that are to be exempted. Governments will often say health care is going to be protected, you can't run off and free trade and health care, whatever. Uh, but running shoes, cars, whatever, they'll have these agreements. So the, the things that become listed as tradable goods are then much more to be handled by the market than governments. And so governments would take a smaller and smaller and smaller space. And that went with the whole concept of economic globalization, that governments had overreached after the Second World War, uh, we were getting all the SOFA programs in, 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 in the global north, and they had gone too far, and the welfare state had gone too far, and we had to move back, and they had to give power to corporations. <clears throat> and it worked. Um, of the hundred world's 100 largest economies, 69 are transnational corporations, and 31 are countries. Just think about that. 
So when a big transnational <clears throat> company comes into a country and says, we're going to invest here, would you just put the other way while we dump our toxins there or while we treat your people like that? You bet, you know, they have great power. So it worked, but it's swinging back because as I said earlier, it failed so badly during COVID and it's failed anyway so badly in so many areas. So I was reading this thing this agreement and saying to everybody, what does this mean? And at the time we were fighting, you may have studied this, there were two massive proposals to commercially sell, not to spare, Canada's water to send it to, to California, which was already in crisis then. Um, so we could be we, selling our water to Las Vegas so they could have, have their golf courses and, and, and the fountains and, and all of that stuff. And we were really opposed to that. And I helped form an organization fighting the free trade agreement. But water just came from nowhere. So, I mean, it sent me on a journey. Well, who owns water? Who's making decisions about water? And it wasn't very much longer that I started finding that in the global south, people were going without water because it was being removed from them because private companies were coming in and if you couldn't afford their prices, too bad. Maybe there's a charity somewhere who could do okay. Um, and this, and it just kind of exploded at the time. So it's interesting you'd ask about the Great Lakes because the Great Lakes are shared by the United States and Canada and we have not taken proper care of them in any way. Again, this myth of abundance and so much, they're so big, nothing could ever happen to them. I think you're going to find that that issue is going to come back up again. Um, the whole issue of water, um, they're already talking about a North American energy grid. So that would be using Canada's water for North American energy grid. They're now talking about a North American a fine minerals grid, which is again Canadian lithium and so on, fine minerals. Um, for American industry. And Canada always says, okay, whatever we want, but okay, we like some of you better, we like Biden better than Trump, but no matter, we'll say yes, right? Um, and I predict it's going to come back. There's no question it'll come, it'll come back as a, as a dispute. Now, one good thing, this is very North American, forgive me, but we fought hard because water was included as a tradable good, but also um, <clears throat> there was a clause in the NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, that said that if any of our water started to be commercially exported to the United States, we couldn't turn off the tap. It would now be North American. So we were really fighting against water exports. The new trade agreement that was agreed to drop that. Um, so, you know, when I thought we fought that for, well, since 1985, when we got rid of it two years ago. So, when you think about winning and losing a campaign, and it may take 30 years, you know, before you see it. It's called ISDS, where corporations have the right to sue governments of another country under a free trade agreement. And we got rid of that as well in between. So we actually have seen some real um, changes to understanding the need to protect water, the need to protect nature from corporate uh, uh, assault to these trade agreements. But I would urge you to learn more about concerns around trade because <clears throat> most of us think all oh, this is a thing over here. There are these trade experts. Some people in some unions are watching it and concerned about it. I don't have to. These these make determinants around our lives. These agreements are, are very important in ways we don't understand. Um, and, and but the, there's no question there's going to be um, dispute as there's dispute about the Nile River now, uh, as there's dispute about Colorado in the United States. They're fighting amongst themselves in the states, and everybody they cut off Mexico altogether. It's, it's like, oh yeah, you're just Mexico. It's, it's going to be everywhere, in my view. And the sooner we can face what we're dealing with and sit down and talk about justice, <clears throat> talk about restore, protecting and restoring watersheds, not moving water from where nature put it, um, sharing and justice, maintaining democratic control about who has, who's making these decisions. This is really important. Um, and we just don't see what happening as much as should be in these agreements. But, I think you're going to find this. I'm, I'm predicting you're going to find some of this happening here with the water <clears throat> that you have stored in those places in, in your country. Mm -hmm. One regard, and the other, I mean, the 
we think that the different things in right now will try to solve the most surprises in the social issues. Next slide. Well, just <laughs> Um, so I'm repeating some some of what I said, but I would I I would get if you're at this university, I would get to know what the blue community is, um, and to become part of the the project here. I mean, it's only going to be as good as the people who are attending this university or teaching at this university are going to be. I'd love to see Zurich. Uh, the city of Zurich become a good community, but to get involved, it's really important to take steps because sometimes you say, okay, I recognize all that, but what can I do? Um, and getting involved in the good community's um, movement is a, is a really good step and stop drinking bottled water is a good step. Maybe on that note, do you know? The discussions between Zurich becoming a blue community. Uh, we have any ideas about yeah. um, one of the blue communities. Um, blue community is not an organization, it's a network. Everybody can become a blue community by self declaration. You just follow the four principles that you will find on our website. Um, so we have cities, communities, um, faith-based organizations, uh, trade unions. My home base is the trade union of public services. We got a new community because uh, we had a law on water that came to the parliament of Canton Zurich. And the first proposal was not that bad, but then in the parliament, they put like all garbage into the law. So that in the end, it would even include passes which would say you can privatize at least partially water. And for us, it was not acceptable. So we made a referendum against it. We had a location. It was turned down by a vast majority. There is a new water law now in the meantime, accepted without any privatization terms in it. So um, in the whole debate, we always try to extend the network with community. As I said, not by formal membership, but by inviting anybody. And I always say it's like from the smallest kindergarten to the elderly home from the smallest village in the biggest city, from whomever, everybody can come to the community. Uh, in Cotton Zurich, we had Piedi Pond as the first city that became a blue community in our canton. And we know that even if you are always joking that Bern is slow, they were the first ones, the first ones to become blue community in Switzerland. And we know that Zurich had always said we are so fast, and even the city of Zurich, they're so progressive and always the best. Some have used it difficult to move forward there. So we do have good context. We are in discussion. The next step, we tried uh, Wettensfield. We are trying now Winter Tour. We just invited for our first meeting in Winter Tour. Anybody interested in and maybe living in the strike of Winter Tour, let us know. We kindly invite you to come there. But that's how we do. We cannot force anybody. We cannot, I don't know, whatsoever. Also, City of Philip, we would love it. But it's like always, you need the first person who says, that's my thing, I gotta do it. And this first person would then maybe talk to like others, but they're already six. And then think about how we can get moving forward. So it's in every company, in every organization, in any village, in any city, in Vietnam, it was one person who made a proposal to the local government and said, Vietnam should become a good community. And they took it up on the administration side in the, in the city of Pietico. They developed the plan, what they would mean, how they could do it. And they were convinced they committed that they wanted the parliament. So even if the mayor there is from the party which you would think is like on the far other side, they were in favor of it. They supported it. So I hope Zurich also one day, city of Zurich, will say, you are not too good. Uh, it's good if like Paris and um, Berlin and Bern and others can do it, we should also be able to do it. Okay, we need somebody to really take um, the steering wheel um, in the local government AD and, uh, and move it forward. So far, we are working with other cities and trying to first surround the city of Zurich with uh, blue cities around it. Until one day they feel maybe so afraid by all these blue cities that they think maybe we should come up. We're on the way to say. We didn't give up hope.
<laughs> many of you know city council, municipal councilors, the elected officials. This is a good place to start with the debate and the discussion. And in Canada, what we did was our chapters of our organizations would go to the municipality and make a presentation. Um, and then they think about it and then they do some research. And, and it can be a lovely celebration. We had a wonderful celebration last year when this university became a good community because you're you're thinking about something positive. You know, there are a lot of issues that we're all dealing with, like the horrific war in, in Ukraine and, and the climate crisis. But, you know, the, you know, we're all, if you're, what, what's the thing is if you're, if you're not, if you're not concerned, you're not, you know, you're not paying attention, right? Uh, so, but what to do with that uh, feeling of, of, of helplessness, hopelessness that I talked about at the beginning, take action, do something. Um, take the next step, and uh, <clears throat> magic things can come out of it. I mean, I, <clears throat> I'm keeping track of wonderful projects around the world where they're bringing the, the, the land back by bringing the water back, by restoring water feds and bringing life and vegetation and wildlife back um, because we've, we've stopped abusing water. We have a wonderful um, environmental estate of Suzuki who says, if we stop abusing nature, people will be kinder to us than we deserve. I think it's quite wonderful. Um, so we need to we 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 need a change in our in our thinking. We just need to start thinking new and protecting this mother earth that gave us life. Great. I think those are very, very good closing words. Um, thank you again for this wonderful talk. Um, we have the opportunity um, to talk more, to know to each other, um, to talk maybe to some of the people from the Blue community um, over coffee, and there is cake. It's out of the door, up the stairs to the right. There's a whole bunch of people sitting in the back. She can wave your hand for a second. You can follow them to the coffee. <laughs> Where the coffee is, there is also still the exhibit about the book community. So maybe afterwards you can have a look. And then finally, there is um there is in the library still an exhibit. Once you enter the library, the geography library or the sciences library, across from the blue square. As soon as you go in, there are bookshelves with books from out and uh, similar topics. So if you want to know more, they are very easy to find at the moment because they're all on the same bookshelf right at the entrance. Uh, but otherwise, also have a look at the exhibit, the posters, uh, but please first come for coffee, continue discussions and questions. And thank you again. For